Today, the latest weapons, coupled with the fighting skill of the American soldier, stand ready, on the alert all over the world, to defend this country, you, the American people, against aggression. This is the big picture, an official television report to the nation from the United States Army. Now, to show you part of the big picture, here is Sergeant Stuart Queen. I wonder how many Americans realize what startling new methods in medical and surgical treatment are being developed for servicemen and their families. Being developed by continuous research at special laboratories and test centers in the Army. The saving of lives through sensational new skills in the healing art is the subject of this section of the big picture. This is the military age of flame and fire. Liquid fire. Flash fire. Rocket fire. Jet fire. Fire and flame and burns. This is the age of burn wounds. Even in wartime, there was never so high a percentage of severe burn casualties as now in peace. Nor as high a percentage of recoveries from severe burn wounds. As the ratio of burns increased, the concern of the United States Army Medical Corps intensified. Out of the experience of Army medics and their imaginative research, there developed a group of Army experts in advanced, unique, and dramatically successful methods of burn treatment. Headquarters of the Surgical Research Unit, a component of the Great Brook Army Medical Center, is at Fort Sam Houston, San Antonio, Texas. To understand what is being accomplished here, let's follow one typical case starting with the injury itself. Lieutenant Jim Leeton smashed up in his Air Force jet plane. When they pulled him out, he was found to be suffering from 40% burns of feet, legs, arms, body, and face. Only a few years ago, burns of this nature and extent were almost always fatal. But with the new concept of burn treatment developed here, each day brought with it 24 healing hours. And within a magically short time, the patient was well on his way to recovery. And here we see him back at his home in Wilmette, Illinois, with his sister, walking the old familiar streets. Back at the old familiar game, too, with his thankful mother looking on. Back at the old wood chopping workout, just as though second and third degree burns hadn't covered almost half of his skin surface. In his convalescence, there is little evidence left of his massive injury. A happy testimonial to the talent, patience, and daring of the Army's surgical research unit. So that this man who stood at the gates of death can walk out through the gates of his home to life. Perhaps you wondered how Lieutenant Leeton remained alive to reach Brook Army Hospital from the distant airfield where he was so critically injured. All such cases start with a phone call to the chief of the surgical research unit from the scene of the accident. Medical men at the scene are instructed in emergency burn treatment, and all aspects of the case are carefully compiled. Not long after that, a surgical research unit burn team takes off in a military Air Force transport plane from nearby Brooks Air Force Base. The 1734th Air Evacuation Squadron supports the burn team in the evacuation of burn patients. A heartwarming example of the integration of the services. 
Such mercy flights are constantly being flown to every corner of the nation to care for servicemen and their families in a time of helpless fear and pain. Arriving at their destination, the burn team go at once to their patient. Their special medical equipment accompanies them. They see for themselves the extent of the serviceman's injury and prepare him for the flight back to Brook Army Hospital. Every device known to or developed by the unit will be used to sustain him now and during the flight. Their experience with burn wound care enables them to start at once the type treatment best fitted to halt the effects of the injury. Then they prepare to return with their patient, who is receiving shock allaying fluids, including whole blood. Intensive treatment continues throughout the entire evacuation. During the flight, the plane serves as a flying hospital ward. The burn team, two physicians, two nurses, and a corpsman give the patient the care at which each is an expert. This conception of a flying team of burn treatment specialists has prevented hours of suffering and saved many lives. On their return to Brooks Air Force Base, all is in readiness to receive the patient. Every consideration is given to the man suffering the first effects of a shocking injury. A waiting helicopter often becomes the ambulance in which the burn victim is whisked from airfield to hospital. On many critical occasions, this time-saving route above ground traffic has minimized delays. Hurried into the hospital, the patient at once comes under treatment. Seriously burned patients lose tremendous quantities of body fluids. So as you have seen, infusions of plasma, a plasma expander, or blood are usually imperative and continuous. Patients are weighed upon admission and daily to indicate the loss of and need for body fluids. A fluid calculator helps in computing the amount of fluids needed in the treatment of burn shock. It is simple, fast, and it permits immediate action. No time is lost. The patient is wheeled to the operating room for the start of his hospital care. The doctors make sure there is no lapse in the continuity of treatment. In the treatment of burns involving approximately half of the body, the patient who a few years ago was doomed now stands a good chance of recovery. Initial surgical procedures are performed in a separate operating room, staffed and equipped to meet all emergencies in burn treatment. Specialized equipment and trained personnel facilitate patient care and greatly shorten the time he must remain in the operating room. This patient's breathing passages have been burned so a tracheotomy was performed to supply him with life-sustaining air. Near the hospital is the ultra-modern laboratory building. New concepts in care and cure are originated in these laboratories. In bacteriology, The bacteria which normally colonize the burn wounds are isolated. Then they are identified so that the miracle antibiotic drugs can be used effectively. in physiology.
To help the patient's defense mechanism combat the crippling effects of burns, new drugs and new methods are continually being investigated. In biochemistry, A multitude of blood tests each day help correct blood deficiencies that follow burning. In the radioisotope section. Here the true nature of the body's response to severe burning is being brought into sharper focus. Advances in patient care include pioneering in the use of exposure in burn wound treatment. And in methods for using donor skin grafts to save the lives of severely burned patients. Only skin grafted from the patient himself or his identical twin will be retained permanently on the wounds. But grafts from other bodies temporarily close the open wounds and serve approximately 30 days. By this time, the patient has improved sufficiently to withstand the cutting of grafts from his own body. He has shown photographic proof of his bettering condition. His improvement then becomes rapid and his morale keeps pace. Working with the army doctors, a skilled dietitian prepares the special diets needed by burn patients. Highly trained chefs prepare and serve them. In this case, a liquid meal is required containing the food elements which will help most in healing the burn wounds and speeding the patient's recovery from the ravages of his injury. But the mission of the unit embraces not only patient care and research, it also includes teaching. Classes consist of medical men from all the armed services. Air Force trainees serve and study for three months. And a Navy surgeon is detailed annually for one year of learning and operating. Care for the emotional life of the patient is part of his treatment and cure. His relatives and friends are welcomed, for their presence is medicine for his morale. No matter what his religion, the patient is encouraged to find in it the faith to sustain him through his convalescence. The patient, too, is made to feel that the hospital gladly receives his home folks as part of his restoration to health. He is encouraged to keep in touch with them. Recognizing that burns are the most devastating and frightening of injuries, the Protestant women of San Antonio have organized not only to comfort patients, but also those who come to visit them. Working with their chaplain, they bring religious faith to the burn victims and diverting activities to their saddened relatives. San Antonio's historic shrine, the Alamo, interests and relaxes the visitors. Over it flies the Lone Star flag. And at the entrance, the Alamo, 1718, Mission, Fortress, Shrine, Cradle of Texas Liberty.
So visitors forget their tensions and their more cheerful mood cheers and helps the patients. An example of burn treatment given servicemen's dependence is little Joyce West, here swathed in bandages under the bed covering and being comforted during her ordeal. She was cruelly burned in neck, body, and thighs. Here is Joyce today on the left, cured and happy after her horrifying experience. Her injuries a few years ago would have meant certain death. If atomic warfare is ever visited upon our country with its inferno of searing flame, the experience gained in the surgical research unit will contribute greatly to care of burn casualties and their rehabilitation. With its methods for rapid and effective burn therapy, lives will be saved, suffering will be minimized. At a time when they are most helpless and most hopeless, the surgical research unit comes to comfort and heal the serviceman and his family. In Lincoln's words, to care for him who shall have borne the battle. Yes, and the serviceman and his family receive this highest type of specialized medical skill at a time when nothing less will suffice to relieve suffering and save lives. Now our big picture cameras focus on what for them is an unusual subject. Another camera, the Army's new lightweight portable television camera. This camera is an example of just one more step forward in your Army's technological search for new equipment to do a better job in less time. At Fort Monmouth, combat television takes another big step into the future as men of the Signal Corps prepare to demonstrate the Army's new fully portable TV camera. The battery-powered transmitter weighs 47 pounds, the camera only 8. From each field camera, an image flashes to the monitor jeep, where the desired picture can be selected for viewing. The electronic scout teams move out, completely free from the cumbersome cables which heretofore limited their mobility. The teams are composed of two men a cameraman, and a rifleman who also carries a handy talkie radio for communication with a monitor jeep. In demonstrating the capabilities of the new camera, the teams focus on prominent terrain features, such as this dam. The word is passed, and back at the monitor jeep, a key is punched, flashing what the camera sees onto the screen. Another button calls up the image of a traffic artery, which is being covered by a second camera team. Still another team waits by a railroad to add its visual report to the others. From the Jeep, the electronic roll call goes out and is answered by images from each camera team in its turn. With the portable transmitter camera a proven practicality, military leaders can look forward to the day when field commanders will receive instantaneous television reports on field conditions while they are developing from his electronic reconnaissance patrols. Now let's turn our big picture cameras to the peaceful little town, Garmisch Partenkirchen. It is here that a young American army couple have chosen to spend a few days leave. Let's join them for their Alpine holiday. Nestled at the foot of these rugged peaks is a peaceful resort village called Garmisch Partenkirchen, a favorite winter playground of Germany's Bavarian Alps, and a special favorite with service personnel based in Germany. People like Frank and Ann Miller, here for a few days leave on an Alpine holiday. Yep, that's us all right. We sure never thought we'd be taking a vacation in the Alps on my pay. But with the special rates they give service people up here, the budget took it with no complaint at all. 
Our first look around the village streets told us we'd made the right choice. At the end of World War II, the 10th Armored Division had its headquarters in this area. But there's nothing about the gaily painted buildings of today to remind you that there ever was a war. These paintings are in an Alpine tradition. Even the bowling alley had a mural. We arrived just after a snowfall, and everything was muffled and quiet. The tourist booklet wasn't kidding when it said, picturesque and refreshing. Then came the Zugspitz, the highest mountain in Germany. Here's where we took our first ride in a cable car. At the top, we found another good deal for service people. Here, you can rent a complete ski outfit for a dollar a day. Of course, while the attendant smiles at your better half, he may hand you a hat made for two other guys. But it's all in the game. Ah, that's better. Not bad for a buck. Of course, neither one of us had ever been on skis before, but that was a minor detail. Like Ann said, we just couldn't pass up those bargain rates. I figured it this way. If you're smart enough to lace the boots, you can learn to ski. When we finally came out, we looked like skiers anyhow. There's something about that sharp mountain air that's exciting, and so is the view of the big ski slope. That was a little out of our league, though. The ski bowl down below, that was more our speed. That's where they hold the classes. I guess we got so wrapped up in the scenery, we almost forgot to wrap ourselves. A couple of minutes more, and I'd have had a quick frozen wife on my hands. Now for the big adventure. The sign said beginners use cable cars. And I guess that meant us all right. Maybe you could find two people to fit the description better, but I don't know where. Anyway, I never heard of breaking your leg in a cable car. The cable car is pretty much standard equipment on all the higher mountains of Europe. In addition to being darn practical, it gives you a ringside seat for the most spectacular scenery in the world. Of course, at times, the scenery can go from the sublime to the ridiculous. Almost before we knew it, we were at the bottom again. Time to unload, get those skis on, and see about locating the ski instructor. Right off the bat, Annie got a little bit overconfident. What's so hard about this, she wanted to know. But before I could give her an answer, she had one of her own. The instructor called this little doozy the slide ski. It looks easy, but whoops. Well, if at first you don't succeed, give up. This isn't exactly by the book, but it shows the old girl knows how to use her head. Ah, but that's a trouble with wives. No sense of humor. Off she went fumbling about swell-headed males. Oh, well, it was child time anyway. After a good hot lunch, things looked a lot rosier all around. We dropped by to watch some real skiers in action. Some local people were gathered for a slalom competition, and they were good. guys do it, it looks easy. And it is. All it takes is 10 years of practice. Watching these experts sort of got us all fired up again. So, back to the trail. We actually started getting the hang of it this time. Well, after a fashion. By mid-afternoon, we took the big plunge and started on a little downhill run. Annie surprised me. She was doing great. Whoa, there now. Let's not get carried away. Still, as long as we're doing the impossible, try this one on for size. Ah, 
As the Indians said, how? All things considered, it was a highly successful afternoon. Though I think in the end, we brought more snow back on us than we left out on the slope. Hmm, now there's an idea. After all that exercise, I could eat a horse. And I guess now's as good a time as any, because our spot by the fire seems to be taken. That's another thing about Garmish. There's no age limit on ski fans. They come in all sizes and shapes and shapes. Let's see now, where was I? Oh yeah. So after supper, one of the instructors joined us by the fireplace. I was all wound up about ski talk, and Annie, well, she was closing up shop for the day. But not before she agreed with me that when it comes to vacation spots, man, this is the end. We'll leave Frank and Ann Miller to enjoy their Alpine holiday. A holiday made possible by the special rates and benefits offered to American service people overseas. Now this is Sergeant Stuart Queen, inviting you to be with us again next week for another look at your Army in Action on The Big Picture. The Big Picture is a weekly television report to the nation on the activities of the Army at home and overseas. Produced by the Army Pictorial Center, Presented by the United States Army in cooperation with this station. You too can be an important part of the big picture. You can proudly serve with the best equipped, the best trained, the best fighting team in the world today. The United States Army.